Hello and welcome to Student Affairs Now. I'm your host, Heather Shea. Today we are talking about women and leadership development in college, and I'm thrilled to be joined by authors and contributors to a new book and facilitation guide on the topic. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope you'll find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the profession. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays, and you can find us at studentaffairsnow.com on Twitter, Instagram, all the social medias. Stylus is our, one of our corporate sponsors. So Stylus is proud to be a sponsor for Student Affairs Now podcast. Browse their Student Affairs diversity and professional development titles at stylus.pub. And you can use a promo code SANOW for 30% off all books, including the text that we are discussing today. We are the leaders we've been waiting for, plus three free shipping. So find Stylus on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at Stylus Pub. So as I mentioned, I'm your host, Heather Shea. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am broadcasting from East Lansing, Michigan, near the campus of Michigan State University. MSU occupies the ancestral homelands of Anishinaabe, Three Fires, Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. So now let's get on to the conversation. First, let's meet our guest today. As each of you introduce yourselves, what would you like to share about the ways in which you have worked with women in college contexts to develop leadership skills, knowledge, and competencies? Um, Julie Owen, I'm gonna start with you, welcome. Thank you so much. And what an honor to be here with this amazing team of people. Um, and Heather, I'm gonna embarrass you later and talk about your role with this book, but I'll save that for a moment. But um, yes, my name is Julie Owen. I'm a faculty member um, in leadership studies at George Mason University in Virginia. And the way I mostly work with women student leaders is through classes. So I teach a course and help develop a course on women in leadership that I've been te for teaching now for about 10 years. So have um, actually a, a, a wide variety of alumni that have graduated from that and watching them sort of blossom in different ways and also come back and talk to the current students as well. And we have people who, of all gender identities in that class. So it's open for men and women and folks who identify as non-binary or gender fluid. Um, so it's a really inclusive space and I've learned so much from those populations. Awesome, thanks so much, Julie, for your book and for, for all the contributions over the years. Um, We've known each other for a really, really long time, so it's also really great to see you. Um, Jennifer, welcome. Hi there, I'm Jennifer Pigza, uh, she, her, hers, and I am the director of the Center for Civic Engagement, Community Engagement at St. Mary's College of California in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm coming to you from Oakland, California, uh, home of the Alone people. I have um, primarily, been spending my professional life in the field of community engagement and social justice education. So that is such a space where so many female students uh, and women identified students participate that um, I feel like even though I never really chose or was called to specifically work in that area, that that is in fact so much of, of what I'm doing in terms of, of student leadership. And then the other piece um, for me is that I was part of developing our master's in leadership for social justice at the college. Um, and our first two cohorts were all, all women. And teaching in that program in that context was just um, really rich because of the different kinds of experiences and stories and kind of ways of being in the world that we could explore um, as a group like that. So that was, that's another piece of Kind of what I brought to this project and hopefully to this conversation too. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Aoi, welcome. Hi, um, my name is Aoi Yamanaka, she, her, hers. Uh, I'm Associate Director of Academic Services and Term Assistant Professor in the School of Integrative Studies at George Mason University, uh, where I teach social justice course and leadership in a global and transnational context so like Julie, I mainly work with a women and student leader in my classes. So for example, in my global leadership course, um, they critic some global leadership models and read articles related to women as a global leaders. So my goal in this course is to usually tackle down the you know, dominant ideologies of um, leadership in a transnational context. Wow, I love it. Thank you so much for being here too. Sherelle, welcome. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Sherelle Hassel Goodman. My pronouns are 
to her and hers. I'm currently a full-time PhD candidate now in the, uh, thank you for the, it's, it's exciting to be at this space. I see your hands like giving me the cheerleading sign for that. <laughs> but uh, so at this point, I am actually doing my own data collection and engaging in research full-time. But prior to that, I was teaching within the School of Integrative Studies and a lot of my courses primarily focused on diversity, equity, inclusion. I taught a narrative of identity class, um, an introduction to social science research, but we explored all sorts of topics within those courses, but particularly thinking about our own identities, whether it's race, gender, socioeconomic status, ability status, um, that was part of the coursework. And then also uh, my work with women in leadership really started um, in sorority and fraternity life. So I was an advisor for a sorority for about six years. And then I worked in sorority and fraternity life for about seven or eight years where I was responsible. Um, part of my job responsibility was to create leadership curriculum for sorority women. Excellent. Well, I love how all of you come from all of these different backgrounds and also approach this work from both a practitioner lens and as a faculty member lens. And so this I think is gonna be a fascinating conversation today. Um, how did all of you end up working on this project together, writing this book? Um, maybe Julie, you talk about the book, book, and then Jennifer talk about the facilitation guide and everybody share with how they got involved. Sure, well, absolutely. Um, you know, I never, I don't think I had the sort of sense of that I could just go and write a book, right? So <laughs> I've been doing some scholarship for years, but um, I felt this was sort of like something that called to me um, in the fact that I was using textbooks for this class I was teaching some people know um, the amazing books, Eagley and Carly's Through the Labyrinth, or Kelman and Rohde's Women in Leadership, both from 2007. And these were such foundational texts. They're thorough and empirically grounded, um, but they primarily focus on women's achievement in corporate America. And um, the university where I am, George Mason University, is one of the most diverse structurally in the country. Um, and so many of my students um, had no desire to sort of break the glass ceiling in a Fortune 500 company. They had a wide variety of aspirations and career goals like um, social activism. They wanted to work in policy, NGOs, you know, wanted to be um, entrepreneurs themselves and not be part of corporate America. So those texts didn't really speak to them. And then also with this amount of uh, structural diversity in my classroom, I realized those books were written um, by white women and mostly for white women. They didn't really speak to other dimensions of identity um, especially the intersectionality I was seeing in the space that I was in. Um, so those books, again, while groundbreaking and discussed like structural underrepresentation of women, but they really didn't talk about how to tackle like the larger patriarchal systems of oppression or the role of power and privilege and leadership. And none of them were really developmental in nature. They didn't sort of say, this is how you can improve um, in the way, thinking more complexly about leadership and about gender. So. Um, I sort of, and they didn't have new editions either. That was the real reason, right? Like I kept waiting for the new editions to come out. So I was getting increasingly frustrated. And um, so instead of using the books for a couple of years, I used the world's biggest stack of PDF, right? Um, you know, 10,000 PDFs from all my favorite authors. And the students were getting frustrated because there wasn't a through line. They're like, what's the story here? And they said, you should just write this book, professor. And I went, oh, you know, when you felt that moment, or like the universe puts an idea on you. And so I knew it was something I had to try to do. Um, but I'm really bad at um, working independently. <laughs> so, so I was so fortunate to be surrounded by brilliance. Um, and, and I also knew that I'm another white woman writing a book about you know, women's leadership. So I really sought out the, some of the wisest people I know, which were um, doc students at the time, Sherelle and Owie, as well as an undergraduate team. And we worked on both researching what books were out there. Um, we worked on, we did an autoethnographic process, a collective autoethnography where we shared stories together. And so um, those stories and narratives are written throughout, woven throughout the books. And so to me, um, um, it was a community kind of effort. And then Jennifer and I are friends from graduate school, so I'll let her tell you that story. But um, we were, I was like, you know, how are we gonna teach this or who's gonna help teach that? Um, and Jennifer's like, I've got an idea. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Jennifer, and talk about the origins of the facilitation guide. Yeah, well, I think that um, as busy professionals and as, as people with full lives, like we often have, we certainly have the capacity to come up with beautiful activities and modules that we might do, um, you know, in our classes or in our programs. But 
isn't it nice when you can have some resources on a shelf to be able to turn to specifically kind of topically related. And in this case, what we decided to do was, um, well, we started off thinking that the facilitation guide really would kind of follow through chapter by chapter with the text that Julie was writing um, with the assistance of her student researchers. And then we realized actually in talking with stylists that they could imagine a group of people who might be interested in a facilitation guide who actually aren't using the text, but otherwise are running programs, teaching other kinds of classes or working in community settings where these kinds of modules could be really useful. So, so right, so that's where we started and Julie had, you know, we generated this cast of characters on giant white paper, uh, you know, big post-it paper, you know, and, and uh, put out the invitations and it felt like a really long process in some ways. Um, but uh, I think at this point, I feel, I feel really good about the ability of the facilitation guide to truly be helpful to people. And also to Julie's point about um, representation among the contributors, there's a really strong mix, I think, of people who are kind of newer to the field um, and early, say, in their scholarly, scholarly lives, as well as people who have a lot of depth of experience. So that that was really important to us as well as um, other types of voices to make sure we're present dimensions of identity. And Sherelle awesome. and Allie, I'm curious how you all got sucked in. You know, why did you say yes when I was crazy? <laughs> you know who I am, you know how I roll. So <laughs> what, when you saw me coming, what part of this interested you? I'm curious. <laughs> well, I think um, for me, I took, uh, I think one of the first classes I took at George Mason was a leadership course, but specifically thinking about students in the higher ed program. And when I took that course, like you and I had a couple of nerd out moments where I was like really invested in the literature, <laughs> thinking about leadership theory and kind of geeked out about that together. But because, you know, as someone who had been a practitioner, but had the chance to totally pause and think about the ways in which Leary, you know, theory, particularly as it related to leadership, impacted me or related to my experience or where it fell short. That was really powerful. And even thinking about my own journey uh, doing leadership work, right, as a student affairs professional, um, you know, in, in my last position, I was a director, like even thinking about how I navigate the academy as a Black woman, right? And so when we were engaging in that conversation, like you joked that there was like the skin that I shed in the class, but it was really an opportunity for me to really think about myself. And so by, you know, you asked the opportunity, like, hey, would I be interested in being a part of the autoethnographical process by engaging with the research team? It was such an amazing opportunity and such a rich experience for me, particularly not only because I'm thinking about my multiple marginalized identities, right? And how, how that's centered, particularly within a leadership context, like how I made meaning of it, but also just the, the opportunity for those experiences to finally be centered, right? And I knew that that was gonna be centered within the literature is something that was invaluable, particularly as we think about the intersectional identities that you know people with multiple marginalized identities, for me, a black woman with a disability, um, you know, but also thinking about what that does for students as we think about leadership to be able to open their perspective was so valuable for me. Um, and I know Awi wanted to add, you know, or, or feel free to add your thoughts about what that was like to participate. And then, you know, maybe we can talk also about what it was like for us to participate in the facilitation guide as well. So Awi, what would you add? Sure. So similar to what uh, Sherelle said, um, I've been struggling as a uh, woman of color, especially international women of color navigating space in academia as a leaders and as well as a leadership educators. So that's why I actually end up writing my dissertations of women faculty of color experience microaggressions and how's that influence self-efficacy. So while I was struggling, Julie asked us like if we are interested in part of this research team and writing our own narratives. So that's why I jump into yes, because this was a great opportunity to, for me to reflect on my actual experiences and they put my thought process on there in, the, in my narratives. So in that sense, um, writing narratives 
was more my feeling process, healing process. And it has allowed me to be nice to myself and then my experiences. Because in the past, I was um, more like a harsh to myself and blaming myself on my experiences. Like I, I'm not good enough. And because of my skill, because of my knowledge, um, you know, experience, microaggression and stuff like that. But reflecting on my experiences to write narratives and like Cheryl experience of the group dynamics of the um, this research team, um, many people like uh, my mentors or like uh, students um, and the group members acknowledge my experiences. And these experiences allow me to confront with myself and my experiences and learn to be my, um, nice to myself and change my perspective on my experiences. And also my narratives um, became my advocacy tool and sharing my narrative in class or in other contexts become part of my advocacy for women faculty and faculty of color. So that's a part of more like a narrative and then in the research team experience. And in terms of the modules or facilitators guide, um, what we wanted to focus when we create this is more like um, um, interpersonal awareness of efficacy and capacities of uh, students of marginalized populations of students of color and women students. Because marginalized populations tend to have a lower efficacy, so we wanted them to reflect on why they engage, why they engage in leadership and reflect on their experiences and engaging in self more like a discovery through um, like uh, what is known by others and or by the person about themselves and then what is unknown by others and or the person about themselves. So it was a great experience. And I think Aoi and I, I totally agree with you, Aoi, like what an opportunity that was for us to do, uh, you know, to engage in healing. The thing that I also appreciated that I realize now after the fact is how simple stories that, you know, Aoi, you and I shared about our day-to-day -day experiences were really how we navigate things daily mm -hmm. that we're putting into paper, where we're putting on paper, letting people read and find that it's connecting with students, right? And it's connecting with those that are reading it and saying, wow, those are my experiences too. And I too share that. So even though it just was us sharing, you know, in, in a very simple way, what we experience from time to time, we didn't realize how much it really has started to resonate with people until like the book has come out and to hear people engage in uh, conversation about the impact of it. And to me, that, that really speaks volumes to how valuable this experience is, not only for us, but also for those people that have been able to engage in uh, the work with us uh, through reading the book and talking about it and experiencing it together. Oh my gosh, I love it. That is so great. Well, I have to agree. I think that there are so many needs for a book like this, um, and it's really powerful to be a part of a collaborative project. So I love that you all saw it that way from the beginning. Um, one of the things I want to step back, though, too, is we've been talking about these concepts of women and leadership. Um, so Julie, when you talk about women, who do you mean? And then when you talk about leadership, what do you mean? Sure. Well, I think leadership educators have, um, we have a history of doing sort of exclusionary research, I think. We have not been as inclusive, um, partly because of this notion of excellence that we've had to sort of trouble a lot and rethink or, or related to leadership. Um, and so a lot of the literature really conflated sex and gender identity and gender expression. It wasn't sort of clear about those kinds of things. Even sex and gender, um, you know, using them alternatively or interchangeably. Um, and so in the book, we're really intentional that gender is far more than one's just manliness or womanliness, um, and that we need to take gender expression, fluidity, and intersectionality into account. Um, and then also think beyond binary kinds of notions of gender um, and, you know, we really feel like when people use those, that hampers the inclusive feminist practice. I mean, whoever comes in my classroom space is welcome, however they identify. And it's been amazing journeys to have people, see people um, being so sort of cognizant of um, um, troubling the notions of gender in the classroom space. So I'll say that about gender. And then leadership itself also has the same problems of definitional unclarity, right? Um, and so many people use the dominant hegemonic default narrative that leadership is people with positional power. Um, it's people doing to others instead of with or for others. 
Um, and so we choose the Come of Us, Lucas and the Man, the old exploring leadership. Um, leadership is a relational process between and among people who seek to make a positive difference in the world. So if people come and they want to learn how to command and control other people, I'm like, that is not what our program is teaching. That is not what you will find in this book. There's plenty of other books I can point you to that will do that, right? And then I just would add that we also took a really intentionally feminist lens, which I didn't really realize was controversial, but I've been doing some work thinking about the book and I've been challenged in several spaces about why I would um, link this writing with feminism. And uh, we use Bell Hooks's um, definition of feminism as the struggle to end sexist oppression, which doesn't really privilege one gender over the other, but invites everybody to interrogate the sexist structures in the world around us. Um, and to me, the answer I gave to that, that especially this one person who really called me out and said, why would you link this to feminism? And why would you make that a political stance? And I said, well, you know, I don't think we're in a post-patriarchal society, right? <laughs> still, or a post-racial society. So I feel like there's still work to do. So um, just like we have to be explicitly anti-racist, we need to be explicitly, explicitly anti-patriarchy um, and how we approach things. And so to me, um, talking about the struggle to end sexist oppression is really, really central to the book. So. I hope I, not everybody has to buy that justification, but that's where we landed as we wrote these different pieces. Yeah, I really, I appreciate the broad definition. I uh, didn't mention this in the opening, but I direct a women's student services office at Michigan State University as one of my roles in, in addition to being faculty. And we have defined women's, so our title of our office is women's student services, but we've replaced the apostrophe with an asterisk. Um, to denote that there's more to the word women than just the binary and that all women, cisgender, transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming folks are welcome in our space and all who want to work to end sexist oppression. So I like the broader definition for sure. Um, and it's so funny that you mentioned the, the Comavis and McMahon um, definition because I think that one of the challenges is that the way that leadership has been largely written about and taught on our campuses even is through this lens of hierarchy um, and positions, um, leadership positions. People will think they have to get into a position and then learn to be a leader. Um, so I think it's a fascinating approach. And I, I really appreciated that you all brought that together with feminism because so critical. Um, and I also have, have received a fair amount of pushback as to why I would link a women's student services office with a feminist, an intersectional feminist agenda, right, is what they call it. And I'm like, well, um, <laughs> why, why not, right? Tell me the reasons why not, so. Well, it's, it's so nice too that um, I think finally leadership educators and leadership researchers are, are there's an emerging critical um, sort of scholarship approach to leadership finally um, predicated some of the work of John Dugan for sure. But it's like, how do we deconstruct those dominant narratives? So both gender and leadership are socially constructed, right? So we get all these messages about what's the right way Leaders, leaders must be confident extroverts who are bossy and, you know, um, you know, we have this list of things that whether we know it or not, sort of inform how we see the world, just like we have around what it means to be woman or man. Um, and so how do we sort of dismantle those dominant narratives and start to rebuild and reconstruct um, more inclusive definitions to me is really, really important. Yeah. Any other thoughts on definitions out there um, that anybody else would like to share comments around? I guess I just wanna point out that um, I think both Allie and Sherelle's, like their telling of their experience of being part of the book is one of self-learning. And that all of us in this process of both uh, for Julie and the main text and the facilitation resource that like we're all in a learning process ourselves. And so, these are not perfect texts, right? There are There is language where you might say, oh shoot, I wish I would have like noticed that before. Or um, so I, I wanna just be honest, I guess, and transparent in effect about the fact that we as writers and contributors and people, frankly, are also learners, right? Um, and, I, and for me, I think that's part of my own identity as a, as a leader my own exercise of leadership is to be transparent about like when it doesn't always work the way that I have imagined or when there is a gap perhaps between my theory and my practice, right? Like, I don't think that's a failing. I think that's just real. And so I, I think that that shows up in some of what P 
people might encounter, you know, in these two texts as well. Yeah, and I have a great story about that is um, another group of people I should just honor. So we have Heather and Chris Rand who did the, the foreword and we have all these amazing student research team did the collaborative autoethnography, but there was a third group out there that I invited that were my critical friends. And if you don't have any critical friends, I suggest people get some critical friends, right? People who aren't scared to tell you their truths. And these were um, emerging scholars around women and leadership who um, really gave me some hard truths as Jennifer was speaking around. You know, you say you're intersectional, but you're still sort of centering white women's stories when you tell the history of feminism in the US, you know? And so that kind of feedback um, was so important. So if, if the book is good and inclusive, it's because of all these voices. Um, and if there's errors in it, it's solely Julie's biopathy, you know, like not seeing it. So I just wanted to thank that group who um, the text is certainly better and more inclusive because of people who risked, took time and energy to read these working drafts and to help um, help me make it speak to more people. We really hope people use it in student affairs spaces as well. It could be a shared reading for a group or people who live on living learning communities. Um, I work with our lead office, our co-curricular leadership development office, and they've used pieces of it. So, so I think some of it's not not thinking it's written. You know, people are surprised there is you know references and scholarship in there, um, but also some jokes. I hope and and some um, you know these reflective pieces. So hopefully people can find ways um, to use it. Maybe if it's not a linear read through. One of my friends is like, I take you to the beach this weekend. I'm like, I'm not sure it's a beach read, right? Um, it's a little more. It's like taking a textbook to the beach. But um, hopefully people would find it valuable in those different kinds of spaces. I really appreciate how the the text, as you said, Julie, it has references, right? It's a real book. Um, it's a real piece of scholarship um, and it engages the reader and predominantly students as readers, you know, in a really personal way. So the reflection prompts that are throughout are not just the ones that, you know, your student research team are offering in the book, but also questions then that the student reader can engage in themselves, right? And apply that and kind of elicit their own story. So I just, I really like how that thread of, of autoethnography and narrative really is throughout. I think it helps the text be useful in a lot of different ways um, and appealing to people, right? Because it's like, oh yeah, my story and my experience is gonna matter and is a perfect, point of entry for me to understand this content, which perhaps could seem dense otherwise, right? Yeah, Jennifer, I think it was a conversation with you where I got that idea of you'd have a chapter called Who Am I to Lead? You know, just really a, a addressing students' own um, sort of ways we might hold ourselves back from leadership or not. I'm not a leader. I just believe this activism and I really care about these things and want these social changes in the world. I'm like, oh, that's, hey friends, that's leadership, right? <laughs> like how we help people sort of find their own belief in themselves that they're capable of doing this work is really important. Mm -hmm. I would also say because of the d diverse constituency of contributors to the book, I think it, it really helps uh, ground conversations where there's not this expectation for the marginalized identity person in the room to have to share their experiences and do the labor for other people's learning, right? And so it takes that pressure off and it also provides an opportunity for people to grow if folks are not even in the room, right? As much as we do leadership programming, I know you try to pan pick a diverse group so everyone can learn from each other. And sometimes it just doesn't work out. And so how the book kind of takes some of that pressure off, I think is also really important to add to any learning environment. So Jennifer, tell us a little bit about this facilitator's guide that's coming out soon. Um, what kinds of activities and how, how do you foresee it complementing the book? I know you had some stylistic choices about maybe decoupling it in some ways, but tell us a little bit about what's in there. Yeah, sure. Um, so the facilitation resource has about 35. I should have counted in the uh, table of contents last week, but has about 35 different modules that really are very much, um, you know, a full lesson plan, if you will. You know, here's how long it takes, here's your material, you know, here's the step-by-step -step kind of follow along instruction. So I think it's really user-friendly in that way. Um, it does in fact follow along the chapter headings of Julie's text um, so that if you are using that text, it's really easy to find, you know, an activity uh, that could be utilized. Um, but you could also just think about those as, 
as topical buckets <laughs> and use those um, modules any place, any time, you know, even build in some of those conversation starters in a dinner table with some, some family friends or uh, students. So I think, um, I think one of the things that's also, well, that's great about the way that the facilitation resource has kind of developed over time is that there are resources there for folks who are both themselves perhaps early in their profession and feeling like I'm more of a fledgling facilitator. And so I wanna tackle this kind of uh, module as well as um, someone who's been doing this a long time. And then there's maybe some more complex, both in process that might be happening in that module, but as well as kind of um, content that might be being delivered and explored in a certain module. So I think there's a mix there for kind of uh, facilitation expertise, if you will. And then also kind of for where students are in the particular program or course that you're working with, right? So, um, so I think that's really nice about the resource. It doesn't kind of hit everybody only at one space uh, or one level of understanding or expertise. Um, I've been really pleased with the, the way that there's a bunch of different ways that the authors of the modules have decided to approach their topic. So there's some that are highly interactive and like all about person to person talking, interacting, you know, moving around a room, you know, and then there's a number that are, you know, over a period of time, write a complex piece about yourself in relation to some questions around leadership and identity and, and um, feminism or, or women and gender. Um, so I really like that kind of spread as well. Um, it's really fun to see what kinds of things people do in a classroom, right? Or in a, in a workshop, right? Like I think most people who would pick up this resource are pretty talented people themselves, but it's just really awesome <laughs> to be able to call upon the like creativity and thoughts of other people, right? So it doesn't um, either all fall on us or all sound the same all the time right, in terms of whoever our audience is. So um, it does come out in February. So it's a little lagged from Julie's text, but I think that's okay. Um, <laughs> it'll still be there, it'll still be great. Um, and I, you know, I think, yeah, I, I'm just, I am excited. It was fun. We, I went through the red lines uh, right before Thanksgiving. We're recording this the first week of December and um, it was just really, great to be reminded of the work. Both Awi and Sherelle um, were contributors as well as Julie um, and you, Heather. So um, I'm wondering maybe, uh, Awi, if you could just talk about how you utilized your module. You talked about earlier mm -hmm. wanting to get into kind of um, where you and Sherelle's module talks about kind of using the concept of the Jahari window and thinking about women in leadership. So maybe that one or one of the other ones that you authored, you could talk about. Sure, actually I use the cross-cultural leadership and gender module that I developed in my uh, global leadership course this semester. And then I always tell others that I live in uh, two different cultures and two different ideologies because I'm from Japan and I still follow some perspectives that um, I develop by living in Japan, right? So that's why I often think that we need to, as a leadership educator, we need to be mindful that not every critical perspective or arguments of a social justice or social justice issues are not applicable to other cultures since our his, their history is different, economy and governments different, and the power structure is different. So this cross-culture uh, leadership and gender module allows students to analyze how systemic power, privilege, and oppression in transnational context, you know, shape the way people view both gender and leadership. So students basically needed to um, analyze one news article in a transnational context using the um, macro level, micro level, and the meso level. And then so that they can more develop like a how US perspectives are not necessarily applicable to um, other cultural contexts. 
And I'm going to share one quote from students that um, they basically stated in the discussions uh, or the, in the paper. Uh, this student said, I realize the importance of multiple identities and intersectionality. There are no traits or qualities that should box a leader in. Instead, leaders should carve their own path and be the best version of themselves that they can be, not worrying about qualities that those before them or those of the same gender of them possesses. And I used to think global leadership was reserved for the people at the top of the pyramid, but now I know that anyone who is given the chance to flawless as a person has the ability to impact the world. So I would say global leadership and global leadership model, some of them still focus on the dominant ideology. So by doing this uh, module, student basically um, deconstruct the dominant ideologies of the um, global leadership and the global leadership perspectives. Wow. Ali, that was one of your students' reflections? Yeah, it was. Wow, I wish I'd had that in my, I wish I get my students there. That's amazing. <laughs> I gotta use your module. <laughs> I gotta go back. That's, That's one of the ones, Zawa, you should put like, um, you know, on your bulletin board there, right behind <laughs> you periodically on a low day, just check it out and say like, okay, it can work, you know, in the right moments, in the right conditions. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, and Awi, I wanted you to talk a little bit about educators and thinking about overlaying intersectional feminism onto concepts of leadership and, and how as leadership educators should we be thinking about those two concepts as interrelated um, and, and the kind of work that you've done and the teaching that you've done. Um, Cheryl, do you want to start and then we'll go to Awi? Sure. So I think that's such a good question because I think the complex like nature of leadership and how it impacts people and systems as a result of like these interlocking systems of power and privilege, privilege and oppression is really hard for students to understand. Like, let's first start off with that. <laughs> I think so by understanding, like taking the time to number one, break those concepts down, which I do think the book does a great job of giving a quick uh, definition that students can understand and unpack, right? Um, that's the first thing. But the other thing is when they understand those concepts in the context of leadership, it helps them to see the larger social inequities that occur, right? So we're talking about systematic oppression. Well, that looks very complicated for students, but when you're giving them something that's very tangible and they start to see it play out within leadership, they start to realize like, oh, wait a second. It's interesting that these positions are primarily for this demographic. It's interesting that these policies really impact this demographic differently. So they're starting to see the ways in which, right, this is played out. And I think that's what is so important. I think the other thing is that when you're doing this work, it can be very uncomfortable for students, right? Students can feel disenfranchised. They can feel completely overwhelmed. Like, where do I even start? They feel guilty, right? There's instances where even um, you're trying to manage both of those feelings at the same time. <laughs> and I think that gets really complicated, but I feel like the, the book and like having these resources and starting to engage in these conversations allows us to begin, right? And it gives us the tools to think about how do we talk about social inequities, particularly uh, within the context of leadership. And I think that's the part that makes it so fruitful and worthwhile because when students start to understand it and you see them enacting leadership in different ways, I think it's very powerful. And even thinking about the process of creating this book, right? The fact that all of us are here as contributors, right? You know, that just shows you how leadership can be enacted even through the process of creating a book. But I know Aoi has really interesting experiences to share uh, because she's been doing the work now with her current course. So Aoi, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, yeah. like Sarah mentioned, like, you know, if we do not address intersectionality of the identity, we overlook systemic oppressions. But at the same time, if we focus on specific marginalized populations and students who do not have a multiple oppressed identity may feel like they are not marginalized enough, so then leadership and leadership educations um, more like a become competitions of oppressions. So the reason I'm saying this, like Cheryl mentioned, I have this specific experience this semester in my class. So in my class this semester, students who had never been centered or whose voice 
had never been heard felt comfortable with you know speaking up her uh, own experiences and then uh, in turn she basically um took uh, so much space in classrooms. So as a result, other students felt uncomfortable with sharing their experiences because they thought their experiences were not good enough and because they were not marginalized enough. So that, this kind of experience made me wonder that leadership educator um, need to think about, you know, the group dynamics and what we need to do with these students when they are stuck. And I think that um, Julie's book, um, since Julie's book shared the various narratives of uh, uh, students whose uh, identities are, you know, various share various identities. So in that sense, you know, that narratives um, encourage these students who felt that um, they are not marginalized enough, encourage them to uh, share their experience in class. And I, I would just add to that, Aoi actually has a student in her class that I had in my class last semester. And I participated in a session, she invited people to come speak and then students uh, selected to interview people and the students selected me to interview for a project, which is also an amazing assignment that Aoi has that I highly recommend. Um, but in that moment, the student was sharing their growth and even able to talk about how she at first, right, last semester was not comfortable, like as a white woman doing service learning or engaging in nonprofit work. What if I'm working with marginalized communities that I don't identify? Can I still do the work? And I'm like, well, what do you think? And she's like, well, I think I can, but I just have to be, you know, strategic about what that looks like and, and listen. And so I was thinking like, yes. So I think if you're willing to give it time, right, students will develop and figure out how to do it. And if they're stuck and confused, that's okay. Give it time, right? And the next semester, right, they'll start to get clarity and we just have to kind of stick with it. And so that's the other thing that's very promising about these resources is it gives us mechanisms to use for students at different points in their journey. Well, this is fantastic. I, I'm loving this conversation. I hope, um, I hope we can maybe have a part two of this dialogue when the facilitation guide comes out because this is great. Um, one of the foundational principles I know, Julie, you talk about um, in the book is this idea that um, leadership has often, women's leadership books have often portrayed like more feminine characteristics as primary versus feminist um, leadership. Can you talk about how you define those two terms? Like what is the difference between feminine leadership and feminist leadership? Yes. Well, and some of this I stole from you, and I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> but yeah, I think most of the, again, historically, the leadership research has been to like early studies of women and talk about how women lead differently than men, right? So it's very binary and comparative. So every study is framed in this binary and comparative way. Um, and then they come up with the similar conclusions of feminine leaders are caring and collaborative, while male leaders are assertive lone wolves, right? And so... Um, Whenever people talk about feminine leadership styles, it sort of is like nails on a chalkboard for me because I think they're reinforcing this hetero essentialist and heteronormative kind of way of being. Um, so how do we think differently about that? One of my biggest pet peeves is people keep writing, Julie's gonna talk about women's leadership. I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, we worked really hard to call it women and leadership um, to talk about all the different ways that could look because it becomes a precarious pedestal is some of the language um, that I use about if feminine leadership must look like this. What if I'm a woman who leads in an assertive or agentic way? Am I not doing leadership? Or if I'm a man and I lead in a caring, should men not be caring and collaborative? Oh my gosh, you know, we want uh, men who exhibit those kinds of qualities. So we don't wanna say that women's leadership has to be one way. So rather than those feminine, binary, exclusionary, comparative ways, we'd much rather focus on feminist leadership. And I quote a lot, the book is really um, centered on um, Shay and Ren's amazing article about how we shift from feminine, feminist ways of leading that's in uh, Paige Habercurn and Dan Tillepa's New Directions on Student Leadership. So I wanted to give them a shout out as well for pioneering so much of this work. Um, and Heather will get embarrassed, but I'll just read. She says, feminist leadership is both a philosophical stance and a way of leading that can be employed by any gender, including cisgender men. So it's an inclusive approach 
um, but that doesn't talk about it must look one way, but rather strategies to leverage and surface power within leadership. So Heather, just thank you for that work. I've got to have a public opportunity. Thank you for that work um, that you and uh, Chris Wren did. It's really, really powerful. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And I will say um, it's based on many people who have written on feminist leadership, um, including one of the people I've cited quite a bit, um, Kowalski Braun, who says if feminists are going to be acknowledged, they have to, that feminist leaders have to have that leadership named as such, right? And so um, I, I really appreciate the, the pairing of the two because I do think that it provides um, a way to look at leadership through the lens of social change. Um, so yeah, I, one of the ways, one of the things that um, came up for me when early on, I had leadership development, um, leadership educator roles at previous institutions, actually worked with Paige at the University of Arizona, it's such a small world um, yes. that we live in. Um, but, uh, you know, I arrived as a director of a women's center at a different campus before I came to Michigan State. And I realized that a lot of students were coming in with these like models of leadership and they like women's ways of knowing kind of models of leadership that that's the way that they wanted to be a leader. Um, and not only were we not talking about that, but we weren't pairing that concept of feminism with it. So um, yeah, it's been fun to kind of pull that apart a little bit more. So as you've, you've mentioned one um, great resource uh, as far as the, um, the um, Haberker and on Tillapaw monograph, but I'm curious if there's other key resources and we're gonna post in the show notes for this episode, um, some of the things that you all share. Um, so Aoi, do you wanna start, share, share some of the resources that you would encourage folks to um, look at to develop their knowledge? Sure, uh, one resource that I recommend is this changing the narrative, socially just leadership educations. And then um, in addition to Julie's book, I often refer to this book because this book talks about um, social identities and then the leadership educations. And then uh, this book talks about the, um, so black female student leadership development or um, Latina leaders identity development stuff like that and at the same time this talk, book talks about the uh, more like a curriculum development co-curricular development perspective so this book is uh, highly recommended as well. Great. Cheryl, what would you like to share? Hope oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. Uh, Oh, Super's Beyond Respectability, The Intellectual Thought of Race Women. I love this book because it features, you know, Black women, uh, particularly like Anna Julia Cooper, Polly Murray, Mary Church Terrell. And I think they give you a blueprint of seeing, you know, women in action, particularly Black women in action, engaging in leadership. And so it's, it's almost like a case study of different women. And you could be thinking about Black women, how they're engaging in leadership doing right what they're meant to do right and, and so what they chose to do so i think it's just so great to, to see that in context and it also gives you historical perspective which i appreciate oh thank you for that that's great uh jennifer yeah i think um maybe connected to that cheryl i'm really interested in um stacy abrams new book uh and uh haven't looked at that at all but right now what i'm reading I so i think one of the things that's been really striking me lately as i also work on um, some things related to combating white supremacy culture is just more and more and more realizing that the way our organizations work, we call it a bureaucracy or we call it traditional leadership, but that's really a white supremacist frame. And so um, I am currently reading um, Just Us, an American Conversation by Claudia Rankin. So I really like her narrative approach to what it means to look at race in, uh, in the United States. And she also talks about her relationships with various people as she's understanding race and as she thinks about what it means to both transform personally as well as kind of structurally. So um, not exactly straight on topic on women and leadership, but for me, uh, it's a very strong thread from one to the other, so. Awesome, so good. I'll put that on my list also. I haven't read it yet. Uh, Julie. I am yes. familiar with this book. 
Yes, well, I've been, um, you know, those memes all summer about when um, things get rough, white women join book clubs, you know what I mean? Around, <laughs> And I, I was like, oh, that's so true. It's heading close at home. I was in like five different anti-racist book clubs this summer. Um, and, you know, I, I want to both invite that and then have people not stop there about just reading stuff, right? We also need to change things and uh, use our, use our, spend our privilege in ways to make more um, equitable places and spaces. But if you're going to do some reading, <laughs> um, I first of all, I'll just say anything by Roxanne Gay. And I loved bringing gay to the classroom. My students just, a bad feminist, still speaks to them in ways that no other text does. And it's again, another way to do multivocality in the classroom. So it's not just my voice as the uh, educator who they're hearing. Um, and so it connects with students that I, you know, that I maybe don't speak to in the same way. Uh, but right now I'm reading Mickey Kendall's Hood Feminism, notes from the women that the movement forgot, which is really powerful about sort of how we rethink mainstream feminism um and how we can move forward in different ways but she's as i know it's a good book because it's made me uncomfortable in lots of spaces you know when i read i'm like oh i need to do more work and i need to do more thinking about that so um i haven't finished it yet so anyway but it's, it's powerful and provocative um so i we are nearly out of time and this has been such a fabulous conversation i'm so grateful you for your time today uh, we always end our podcast though with a question um, because this podcast is called Student Affairs Now. Really quickly, what are you pondering, questioning, or troubling right now? Um, uh, Julie, I'll start with you this time. I'm I'm still troubling um, what the digital divide is doing for my students. Right, like I'm in the middle of grading finals, and I'm looking at um, who hasn't been served by online education. So I'm just trying to think about ways to fix that and how to do more personalization and individualization and in online learning. So that's what I'm thinking about. Great. Sherelle, do you want to go next? Sure. I think what I've been thinking about is the impact of all of our new interest on doing education in the area of racial injustice and what it does to uh, people with multiple marginalized identities, particularly I'm thinking about Black women, Black trans women, and what this period of being interested in their stories uh, does with them personally and their own personal wellness. Mm -hmm. Good point, great. Aoi? Yeah, so based on my experience in my class this semester, I'm pondering what are the dynamics, group dynamics in online education, both asynchronous and synchronous courses and how I can create those great space in um, online education. That's I've been pondering. Yeah, great example of that too. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, I'm um <clears throat> I'm really pondering how our how we respond as institutions. So I work at a small liberal arts institution. You know, how are our institutions responding in this moment and how can we use this moment to embrace a different way of being organizations and a different way of serving students. Um, I think there's amazing opportunity. And I think that that opportunity is pretty scary to a lot of people because it involves change. But um, I'm really pondering, yeah, how do we become a different kind of organization that serves students better? Yeah, that is a, I think that is a question at the top of mind for, for many and what, what will higher education look like when we're, when we're through, you know, at least the next hurdle. Um, thank you all so much for your time today as guests on Student Affairs Now. Um, also shout out again to our sponsor and publisher of the book and guide, Stylus. Um, for those who are watching or listening, you can re receive reminders about this and other episodes of the podcast by subscribing to our Student Affairs Now newsletter, which comes out every Wednesday. Um, you can also browse our archives at studentaffairsnow.com, our growing archives, I should say. Um, please subscribe to our podcast, invite others to subscribe on social, um, leave a five-star review. Um, it really helps conversations like this reach more folks and build a community for learning. Um, again, I'm Heather Shea. Thanks to the fabulous guests and to everybody who's watching and listening. Make it a great week and be well, everyone. Mm -hmm.